Thank you. As you already know from my other presentation, I'm not going to deny it to me. So <laughs> I'm a fellow with the OER Research Hub, but I also work with um, research collaboratively with Tony Conklin, looking at OER and open educational practices outside of academia. Now, the open education and OER movements are still almost inseparable from the higher education institutions from which they emerged. And little attention is given to the wealth of OER that are being introduced by subject communities outside of formal education. For example, uh, professional and regulatory bodies. And this is the focus of the research that Tony and I have been doing most recently. So the topic of OER outside formal education um, has been addressed in the 2012 UK-based OER for Adults report, and I've just project projected it up there. And that recommends that the OER movement should recognise that learning takes place everywhere, and should encourage OER development by organisations and communities outside mainstream education. And I have a quote here that says that the, the um, researchers source excellent examples of different types of organisations producing OER, specifically for lifelong learners, um, sometimes in partnership with professional educators, but often it feels not normally touched by mainstream education. And particularly our focus here, and they identify such organisations as private sector companies, public sector institutions, professional bodies, and third sector organisations. Now, since 2011, Tony and I have been working with subject communities outside formal education when developing and piloting the public open scholar role with the aim of increasing awareness of OER and disseminating information about the resource needs of people outside the academy. And if you were at OER 13, you will have heard us introduce the public open school, scholar role there. Um, the role involves open academics working with online communities outside of formal education who might benefit from OER but may not be aware of the existence of, of OER identifying those community members express needs and then sourcing OER to meet those needs and disseminating information about the unmet needs back to OER producers, many of whom are within academia. Now we piloted the role in 2011 with UK voluntary sector communities, online welfare communities and in 2013 we took the Public Open Scholar into Facebook and there we reached an international audience of autism focused Facebook groups in India, Africa and <coughs> Malaysia. Now when we were performing the uh, Public Open Scholar role within Facebook, we began learning from Facebook group members about the wealth of resources that have been produced outside formal education, for example by voluntary sector organisations, government and professional bodies. And when we began this research, we looked at a wide range of welfare com communities. And I'll hand you over to Tony, who will tell you a little bit more about his role in this. Thanks, Leanne. Um, when we began this research, we looked at a wide range of welfare communities. Uh, there's all kinds of topics, including Gramsnet, the Alzheimer's Society, and the Carers Trust. At the same time, and for a few years since I did my school fellowship, a few people here, particularly Jonathan, was instrumental in that. Um, I've been curating resources relating to working with children and young people from my blog site, Give Media, shown here. This reflects my professional background in health and social care and my role outside the work as a chair and a director of a children's charity. Since we took the research into Facebook, we've narrowed our focus to concentrate on autism. And just as a coincidence, the page from my blog here, you can see features an OER 
produced outside of higher education. It's just been released and it's huge, just absolutely huge. This is about children's mental health. Uh, 120 uh, study units in there, I think. Just like that. And we're talking about uh, listening to Stephen there about how long it takes us to produce OER. You know? It's always going on outside, it's happening really quickly. <laughs> That's something to learn. Anyway. Here's an ex another example. Um, this is a book called Good and Bad Science of Autism. And it's written by geneticist um, Dr. Neil Walsh and neuroscientist Dr. Elizabeth Hurley. It's a 94 page book I mean, bringing together scientific research from multiple disciplines, including neuroscience, genetics, and psychology. The authors are writing from within the context of an autism charity, they're the publishers, the charity, right? and they interpret the science to make it accessible. In addition, the examples are made more relevant to charity members. And you can see on the screen there's a Facebook page, and it gives you a sense of the scale and the reach of this charity. And to give you an illustration of the demand, I put a link to this page on to this um, book on my own Facebook page. And then a week I had a thousand hits on it. So the general public are really interested in what others might see as um, quite remote academic research. There's certain appetite for it. These aren't other academics reading it through Facebook. Here's another example. This is a suite of free Creative Commons licensed e-learning provided by the Geneva Centre for Autism in Canada. There are nine free modules aimed at parents and workers, delivered through Move VLE, just as described by Stephen, and they're bilingual in English and French. Once again, there's a link to the Facebook page. And this is a characteristic of the kind of stuff that we're trawling, we're finding it through Facebook, through the subject communities at the top right there. Because the two resources I've just mentioned are listed in tables in our full paper, along with other comparable resources. These aren't isolated. <laughs> you know, they, we could have picked a dozen of each of these. So seeking to source more resources from outside formal education, we started conducting a systematic large-scale search, <coughs> recording not only the number of learning materials available, but critically how easy was it to find them. Remember, we were learning about them by personal recommendation. So we searched with both Google and Bing and a selection of different search terms. Okay, I'm going to talk you a little bit through the results. So once the results were well turned, we closely examined the top 50 um, search results for each of the searches and then we allocated them to each of the following categories. Firstly, um, Courses and resources from universities, and we subdivided that into free, paid, and free. And there were 53 results there. Then courses from colleges and private training institutions, again subdivided into free, paid, and free. And there were 63 results there. Lists and aggregator sites, which we were surprised how um, heavily represented they were, with 51 results there. Then Courses restricted to a members of a professional body or to people in a particular location. For example, there are some courses that were only available to people in a particular state in the US and 44 results there. Our particular interest area was open and or free courses from outside formal education. And there were just 14 results returned in this, this search which um, started giving us a bit of a feel for how difficult these resources were to find for people you know, you know, wanting free and open content in this area. There was a further category that were the erroneous results returned, so it's like free newsletters, and there were 27 results there. And we then looked at the balance between formal education and external subject communities. And as you can see from the graph, it was clear that the autism resources from outside formal education are pretty hard to find, irrespective of the search term or the search engine used. Now, as aggregators, 
and lists fetching and filtering and organising information have featured so, so heavily in our initial search. We then thought, well, it's quite likely that somebody looking for resources on autism would use those, those aggregators. So we then refined our search down to more aggregators and lists. And here too, we found that formal education very much dominates provision. And a lot of the um, aggregators and lists, for example, from Open Culture here, proudly proclaim that their material is from top university. And this is widespread. And so there appear to be um, totally ignoring provision from outside formal education. And we've, uh, we've already found that there's plenty of it. So I'll hand over to Jenny again to talk about some of the implications of these results. Okay, so we've identified four possible implications of these results. We think that learners are possibly being diverted from accessing relevant resources. So relevantly, the OER for Adults report that we began with states that approaches that work well in the university context may be less appropriate elsewhere. Adding that transferring resources produced in one community such as the university to another, such as Google Workplace learners, can be difficult. Just as important, open educational practices are being marginalised. For example, those involved in the creation of this CC licensed electronic textbook produced by YACAPAP. That's the one that's on the screen at the moment. YACAPAP is a global, non governmental umbrella organisation. The book was written collaboratively by over 90 international experts for the benefit of professionals who would otherwise not be able to purchase a printed textbook. So in shorthand, these are psychiatrists all around the world coming together to write a standard textbook for the benefit of psychiatrists in countries where they couldn't get that textbook any other way. So helping their peers around the world. Um, and the ACAPAP are committed to updating the book annually and actively invite feedback from users on any alterations or improvements needed. That to me sounds like open practice. How do you get to the screen? What was it said about Max? <laughs> um, so we also think there's missed opportunities for collaboration um, between academia and external subject communities. Some of the benefits of these collaborations would be increasing the range of resources available, for sure. We also think that there could be the development of resources that can improve the employability of registered students in formal education. Remember that the ones that we're looking at come from the people out there in the field. And we think there would be very useful links and networks for learners involved with their potential future employers in the sectors that they're going to go and work in. And one of the things I've certainly learned is an improved understanding of the sector needs, about what they really want and look for, and what they value in education. Um, and interestingly, particularly harking back to the tests in India earlier, we think there's possibly new business models for the production of OER somewhere in here. Uh, finally, our findings confirm the need for an impartial open content search facility because it really was hard to find this stuff. Um, so we, we think there's a need for a search facility that presents resources from both from within and from outside formal education in order to help the discoverability of the latter. We recently launched Solvenort's Open Content Search Engine and the Open Scout Search Facility are both, we think, very much a step in the right direction. So much switching backwards and forwards. Right, so bringing our, our presentation to a conclusion, I think yeah, that it's probably clear that our findings are indicating the existence of very active subject communities outside the academy. And the open practices that we're going to find here and which exist else, elsewhere are not necessarily recognised within academia, yet could be of immense value 
and this is at a time where there's been a new ER movement is prioritising open practices, use and reuse over content development. So, where does this fit in to the broader literature? Um, it does fit in with the literature um, prompting the ER movement to move away from production, to broaden scope, to encompass other communities outside formal education and outside of the academy. Again, the OER for adults report that we talked about earlier has a, a wealth of, of um, discussion and debate on, on that. Um, also, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I'm a, a fellow with the OER Research Hub, and our research links with the, um, the research that the OER Research Hub are doing on informal learners. There's a survey currently live that is um, surveying the OER practices for formal learners, educators, and informal learners. And the informal learners um, survey results make some very interesting reading. So if you're interested in that area, I would head to the OER Research Hub um, website or the impact map to, to track down that research. And one example of that is some research into the Open University's Open Content Platform, OpenLearn, that I have conducted with Katrina Law and Andrew Law from the OU's Open Media Unit. And that tells a story about how people from outside formal education are using and benefiting from OER. And indicates the great potential there that perhaps is still untapped. And looking back to the first presentation in this session, my uh, presentation on Tess India with Tim, there's, I think, a parallel there in um, terms of providing resources for that then need to be localised in the developing world and the challenges that happen there and expecting that resources from within academia will be entirely appropriate and relevant to people outside academia. We should be concentrating on empowering and recognising the practices that are from the ground up, the practices that really know what it means to be a content provider outside academia. So the next stage of our research will involve looking in more detail, looking more closely at the open educational practices that are involved in creation of resources such as the EFAP um, resource. And here, this is the EFAP Facebook page. They've got 3,251 likes. It's a, a really um, thriving, a vibrant community of people discussing um, issues that, that are important to them. And obviously, as Tony has introduced or oh, said already, developing content collaboratively for the benefit of, of the people interested in that around the globe. And it's clear that these professional communities are more than just passive consumers of resources. They're creators of resources and they adapt as well. They adapt we are to meet their own needs. And we think that this really does deserve attention. And hopefully we'll be back at OER 15 to tell you what we found about that, about open educational practices. So that's pretty much what we wanted to tell you about the research and as, as ever. Really interested in hearing what you've got to say. And also, if you fancy becoming a public open scholar and going into areas that um, you're um, interested in professionally and sharing where you are outside the academy, that would just be great too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Martin from Wikimedia UK, I'm that, I'm that Martin. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just want to ask about what, how narrow is your definition of OERs that you used in this research? Because I'm, I'm surprised you've not mentioned Wikipedia, which comes to the, the top search results. It'll, it'll be the top search result for autism for most people, and it'll get, that article will get uh, tens of millions of hits per year, and that fits a broad definition of open educational resource. I know it's encyclopedic, so it doesn't maybe have much of a narrow definition. But it seems if you include that resource that's kind of the elephant in the room, then um, open education from outside the academy kind of dominates and crushes out inside the academy. It seems to fit your definition of for lifelong learning made by a third sector organisation 
uh, for a general audience and open. Thanks, that's a really good question. Um, I'm an absolute devotee of Wikipedia. Um, the thing, and I'm really interested in the practice that people go through um, to create it. I guess you probably have sensed that we're more interested in the practices than in the end results. To me, that's what education is about. Education is a dynamic activity, it's not an object. So, yet we're absolutely into the thing. The bit that I guess we're really um, surprised by was these Facebook communities, which a lot of people trash, basically. I think people increasingly give Wikipedia a lot of respect. But there has been an, an attitude that Facebook is a bit trashy. And, and a load of these communities aren't, and I think they deserve to be taken seriously. So I guess that's why we haven't mentioned Wikipedia, because I think it already is taken seriously. <laughs> No, it, was, it was probably not so much a question. Uh, uh, sorry, Tom Simon from the University of Sussex. Um, but I was going to ask maybe just to connect the two, as you were saying, to Cindy before and, and looking at Facebook communities. Have you looked at how this might be happening in Facebook communities in developing world contexts? Because they are very active and they are seen or perceived as the open web. Or where people meet, uh, whereas we may be a bit more, I don't know, as you say, look down on them because we have so many other opportunities to interact, but for many, in many other circumstances they can be. Yes, yes, in our um, last year, when we, we took the Public Open Scholar into Facebook and were uh, working with Facebook communities in Africa, Asia and India, there, there, there were vibrant communities, sort of the social layer to, uh, uh, to this, and they were calling out for resources. So they weren't creating, they were, they were creating, but not actually creating resources. And it's something that is ongoing, we're still working with, with those communities, and on a sort of self-educating basis, so making sure it's not top down, where we say, ah, oh, here, we've come to bring you these goodies, these there we are. It's, Saying, okay, this was all. You've just said you, your, your child's going to school for the first time, or why are they basically want to have a cope? Is this a you resource? Know, it's actually, actually it's, um, an OER, and you can adapt it. And here's where you can go to find some more. And so then it's working with the community, and maybe a little bit further along, you might say, hmm, there's three, here's three resources, and talk about then evaluating resources and um, looking at sort of strengths and weaknesses. And so it's sort of working with rather than doing two there. Um, so yeah, I think Facebook, especially in the developing world, is, is, is huge. And also because it can be done mobile on mobile. And that's one thing we found when we were working with Facebook communities, that the format of the resources is really, really important. Some resources just do not display well on mobile. And if mobile is your only access to Facebook and communities, then a certain type Resource. Yeah, yeah, PDFs are out. PDFs are out. Do you want to say any more? Um, I guess I'll. Um, if you want to read more about that, I have a PCF7 paper, which was all about Commonwealth <coughs> countries, um, is where we've explored that in particular. Um, I guess I, I was really struck actually with this. For a lot of people in the Indian communities in particular, the internet and Facebook are synonymous. They actually think what they are all of their um, online activities carried out through Facebook. So you're absolutely right about you know. And I don't think we have that in the West. We still have this notion that Facebook is one of our options. But for a load of people it's, it's one and the same thing. And that could be to do with the power of the Facebook corporation. Uh, so I'll, I'll try a slightly provocative one then. Do you, is it basically that Facebook is, a, is an easier and better tool for curating knowledge than a lot of the tools that we've come up with inside the sector itself? Absolutely not at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so why do so many people, I assume that's one community, but I assume there's tons of other communities on Facebook that are actually increasingly producing valuable knowledge to the participants inside of these communities. Our, um, our Vice Chancellor Martin Lee said you go to where the party is. And in, even in a relatively short time that I had been working with online communities, which started off as bulletin board type communities, they've migrated to Facebook. That's just where it's happening. I don't think it's a particularly suitable platform. I'm sure loads of people would kind of agree with that. But it's the one where the users are. And as we said, it, it does work well um, on mobiles. Another thing that I really didn't realize was that the translation thing works well in there. You wouldn't expect this, but it works well. So if you work in the international world, it will give you instant translations. And that is a real boon if you're working in a global context like Yakka. So it's about instead of us dictating as academics what we're going to use, it's about listening to what the community is using and going with them and using the um, platforms that they're using. And to me that's a, a key values position. You know, you go to where your learners are rather than something you can to us. That's I suppose my, my only follow-up question, which is a long question, is to say whether or not academia in generally are good at doing that, or if there's still a lot to be learned in terms of meeting the learners where they are these days. I think there's a heck of a lot to be learned in terms of meeting the learners where they are. And there is, uh, we develop system after system after system, it's sort of in our own image, in a way. And going, into Facebook for us involved, actually it's more complicated for us than it's for the end users. We're adapting our resources, adapting our, our um, style of expression because of the, uh, they might be something practical like the number of characters that people read, the fact that posts don't last long, the, you know, the whole way that Facebook operates. It would be much easier for just to go to some forums and post some resources or do something in Moodle or say, come to our you know, Moodle, which you know, is great in some contexts. But, you know, you can't kind of make the effort, and I don't think they necessarily generally as going to make that that good of doing it. And it's once you've done it, it's, it's it's not that difficult to go into Facebook and do it. So anybody can do it. You can do it. You can all do it. But you just got to get into this, into the um, the format and into um, take on board what it affords you in terms of possibilities. Yeah. Thanks. I'm Stephen Haggard. I'd just like to come into that discussion um, uh, around the access of open resources, uh, particularly in geographies where broadband is not available. Um, Facebook has been very clever. They've had some hoedowns with their developers in working out how the, in territories where 98, 99% of internet access is through mobile phones and the cost of accessing the internet is excruciating, um, how they can get their page load uh, times down, with the result that, um, you know, the, those, um, the cost, the data costs for poor users to access resources have really become much more attractive on Facebook than on any other um, uh, kind of internet resource. So uh, I think there's just a, a challenge here of understanding the realities of the platforms in which people are accessing any kind of resource in some geographies. Um, and Facebook is going to be, for economic reasons, the uh, platform of default for an awful lot of learners. And I think the whole OER learn, uh, movement has of a, a duty to think much more carefully about the technical and operating environment in which people who are accessing it off-grid, for example, uh, um, off-grid, that's about uh, 600 million um, internet users in the world have no electricity supply. Um, for them, those um, load times and things like that are absolutely crucial, and Facebook's getting it right in a way that a lot of us aren't. Yeah, and this takes us back to the first presentation with, with Tim and Tess India. So the Tess India resources, as Tim explained, some are being produced on, on paper because there is no internet connection. Um, they've been producing DVD, SD cards, but um, I was at in India last year visiting the teacher education colleges, and sometimes there would be one PC in the whole set of schools. Their internet um, could be non existent, some don't have electricity. So, yes, I think the OER movement needs to think bigger than digital. And, uh,